Hello, postmodern mythology back. So I've taken a bit of a break for four months. Um, I had an initial vision for postmodern mythology uh, to expose the mythology of the modern world. We think we are much more intelligent now than our ancestors and um, in this modern world that we don't believe in myths anymore but we clearly do uh, myths are abundant and everybody has their own myths but we also have collective myths and um, valid things like science have become corrupted and turned into mythology and blended with political ideology to meet certain agendas. But I wanted to finish off the first part of Postmodern Mythology's um, series, which started by looking at Antifa and the origins of Antifa and was sort of skirting around everything with the Communist Party of Germany, Comintern, International Working Men's Association, the Labour Socialist International, Cominform, Communism, the January Uprising, 1863, Congress Poland versus Russia, the Napoleonic Wars, the um, Congress of Vienna and 1848 revolutions, and the French Revolutionary Wars and the French Revolution. And and then I had a little sort of foray into um, Paul Tolkien ideology with Leo Strauss and the Neo-Kantians. Um, and I just want to finish that off with Karl Marx. Karl Heinrich Marx, 5th of May 1818 to 14th of March 1883 was a German philosopher, economist, historian, sociologist, political theorist, journalist and socialist revolutionary. Born in Trier, Germany, Marx studied law and philosophy at university. He married Jenny von Westphalen in 1843. Due to his political publications, Marx became stateless and lived in exile with his wife and children in London for decades, where he continued to develop his thoughts in collaboration with German thinker Friedrich Engels and published his writings researching in the reading room of the British Museum. His best known titles are the 1848 pamphlet, The Communist Manifesto and a three volume Das Kapital 1867 to 1883. Marx's political and philosophical thought had enormous influence on subsequent intellectual, economic and political history his name has been used as an adjective, a noun, and a school of social theory. He died aged 64 in London. He lived in Germany, France, Belgium, and the UK. He was Prussian from 1818 to 1845 and stateless after 1845. Political parties were the Communist Correspondence Committee until 1847, the Communist League, 1847 to 1852, and the International Working Men's Association, 1864 to 1872. Spouse Jenny von Westphalen, married 1843, died 1881. Children seven, including Jenny, Laura and Eleanor. Parents Heinrich Marx and Henriette Pressburg. Educated at University of Bonn, University of Berlin, University of Jena, PhD in 1841. School of Continental Philosophy and Marxism. Thesis Differenz de Demokratischen und Epikureischen Naturphilosophie, the difference between the Demokratian and Epicurean philosophy of nature. Doctoral advisor Bruno Bauer. Main interest philosophy, economics, history, politics. Notable ideas, Marxist terminology, surplus value, contributions to dialectics and the labour theory of value, class conflict, alienation and exploitation of the worker, materialist conception of history. Influences, 
Hegel, Ludwig Feuerbach, Charles Darwin, Charles Babbage, Aristotle, Epicurus, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Baruch Spinoza, Jean-Charles Leonard de Sismondi, Friedrich Wilhelm Schultz, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson, Friedrich Engels, Pierre Joseph Pradon, Constantin Pecure, Henri de Saint-Simon, Robert Owen, William Thompson, Charles Fourier, Baron de Holbach, Justice von Liebig, Ludwig von Westphalen, Max Stirner, François Noel Babeuf, Voltaire, Gian Battista Vico, Maximilian Robespierre, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Claude Adrien Helvetius, Francois Guizot, Moses Hess, possibly Victor Considerant, and then there's a list of Marxists, which is incredibly long, but can be broken down into subcategories. Anti-revisionists, black Marxists, Comintern people, communist rulers, Marxian economists, former Marxists, Freudo Marxism, Hoxaists, Marxist humanists, Marxist journalists, left communists, Leninists, Libertarian Marxists, Maoists, Orthodox Marxists, Trotskyists, Women Marxists, and Marxist writers. Marx's critical theories about society, economics, and politics collectively understood as Marxism hold that human societies develop through class conflict. In the capitalist mode of production, this manifests itself in the conflict between the ruling classes, known as the bourgeoisie, that control the means of production, and the working classes, known as the proletariat, that enable these means by selling their labour power in return for wages. Employing a critical approach known as historical materialism, Marx predicted that capitalism produced internal tensions like previous socio-economic systems and that those would lead to its self-destruction and replacement by a new system known as the socialist mode of production. For Marx, class antagonisms under capitalism, owing in part to its instability and crisis-prone nature, would eventuate the working class's development of class consciousness, leading to their conquest of political power and eventually the establishment of a classless communist society constituted by a free association of producers. Marx actively pressed for its implementation, arguing that the working class should carry out organised proletarian revolutionary action to topple capitalism and bring about socio-economic emancipation. Marx has been described as one of the most influential figures in human history and his work has been both lauded and criticised. His work in economics laid the basis for much of the current understanding of labour and its relation to capital and subsequent economic thought. Many intellectuals, labour unions, artists and political parties worldwide have been influenced by Marx's work, with many modifying or adapting his ideas. Marx is typically cited as one of the principal architects of modern social science. Childhood and Early Education, 1818 to 1836 Karl Heinrich Marx was born on 5th of May 1818 to Heinrich Marx, 1777 to 1838, and Henriette Pressburg, 1788 to 1863. He was born at Bruckengasse 664 in Trier, an ancient city then part of the Kingdom of Prussia's province of the Lower Rhine. Marx was ethnically but not religiously Jewish. His maternal grandfather was a Dutch rabbi, while his paternal line had supplied Trier's rabbis since 1723, a role taken by his grandfather, Maya Halevi Marx. His father, as a child known as Herschel, was the first in the line to receive a secular educa education. He became a lawyer with a comfortably upper-middle-class income, and the family owned a number of Moselle vineyards in addition to his income as an attorney. Prior to his son's birth and after the abrogation of Jewish emancipation in the Rhineland, Herschel converted from Judaism to join the state Evangelical Church of Prussia, taking on the German forename Heinrich over the Yiddish Herschel. Picture of Marx's birthplace now, a Brückenstrasse 10 in Trier. The family occupied two rooms on the ground floor and the three on the first floor. 
Purchased by the Social Democratic Party of Germany in 1928, it now houses a museum devoted to him. Largely non-religious, Heinrich was a man of the Enlightenment, interested in the ideas of the philosophers Immanuel Kant and Voltaire. A classical liberal, he took part in agitation for a constitution and reforms in Prussia, which was then an absolute monarchy. In 1815, Heinrich Marx began working as an attorney and in 1819 moved his family to a 10-room property near the Porta Negra. His wife, Henriette Pressburg, was a Dutch-Jewish woman from a prosperous business family that later founded the company Philips Electronics. Her sister, Sophie Pressburg, 1797-1854, married Lion Phillips, 1794-1866, and was the grandmother of both Gerard and Anton Phillips, and great-grandmother to Fritz Phillips. Lion Phillips was a wealthy Dutch tobacco manufacturer and industrialist, upon whom Carl and Jenny Marx would later often come to rely for loans while they were exiled in London. Little is known of Marx's childhood. The third of nine children, he became the eldest son when his brother Moritz died in 1819. Marx and his surviving siblings, Sophie, Hermann, Henriette, Louise, Emily and Caroline were baptised into the Lutheran Church in August 1824 and their mother in November 1825. Marx was privately educated by his father until 1830 when he entered Trier High School, Gymnasium zu Trier whose headmaster Hugo Wittenbach was a friend of his father. By employing many liberal humanists as teachers, Wittenbach incurred the anger of the local conservative government. Subsequently, police raided the school in 1832 and discovered that literature espousing political liberalism was being distributed among the students. Considering the distribution of such material a seditious act, the authorities instituted reforms and replaced several staff during Marx's attendance. In October 1835, at the age of 17, Marx travelled to the University of Bonn, wishing to study philosophy and literature, but his father insisted on law as a more practical field. Due to a condition referred to as a weak chest, Marx was excused from military duty when he turned 18. While at the University of Bonn, Marx joined the Poets Club, a group containing political radicals that were monitored by the police. Marx also joined the Trier Tavern Club Drinking Society, German Landsmannschaft de Traveraner, where many ideas were discussed and at one point he served as the club's co-president. Additionally, Marx was involved in certain disputes, some of which became serious. In August 1836, he took part in a duel with a member of the university's Borussian Corps. Although his grades in the first term were good, they soon deteriorated, leading his father to force a transfer to the more serious and academic University of Berlin. Hegelianism and Early Journalism, 1836 to 1843. Spending summer and autumn, 1836, in Trier, Marx became more serious about his studies and his life. He became engaged to Jenny von Westphalen, an educated member of the petty nobility who had known Marx since childhood. As she had broken off her engagement with a young aristocrat, to be with Marx. Their relationship was socially controversial owing to the differences between their religious and class origins, but Marx befriended her father Ludwig von Westphalen, a liberal aristocrat, and later decided or dedicated his doctoral thesis to him. Seven years after their engagement on 19th of June 1843, they married in a Protestant church in Krausnach. In October 1836, Marx arrived in Berlin, matriculating in the university's faculty of law and renting a room in the Mittelstrasse. During the first term, Marx attended lectures of Eduard Gans, who represented the progressive Hegelian standpoint, elaborated on rational development in history by emphasising particularly its libertarian aspects and the importance of social question, and of Karl von Savigny, who represented the historical school of law. Although studying law, he was fascinated by philosophy and looked for a way to combine the two, believing that without philosophy nothing could be accomplished. Marx became interested in the recently deceased German philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, whose ideas were then widely debated among European philosophical circles. 
During a convalescence in Stralau, he joined the Doctor's Club, Doctor Club, a student group which discussed Hegelian ideas and through them became involved with a group of radical thinkers known as the Young Hegelians in 1837. They gathered around Ludwig Feuerbach and Bruno Bauer with Marx developing a particularly close friendship with Adolf Rutenberg. Like Marx, the young Hegelians were critical of Hegel's metaphysical assumptions but adopted his dialectical method to criticise established society, politics and religion from a leftist perspective. Marx's father died in May 1838, resulting in a diminished income for the family. Marx had been emotionally close to his father and treasured his memory after his death. Picture of Jenny von Westphalen in the 1830s. By 1837, Marx was writing both fiction and non-fiction, having completed a short novel, Scorpion and Felix, a drama, Ulanem, as well as a number of love poems dedicated to Jenny von Westphalen, though none of his early work was published during his lifetime. Marx soon abandoned fiction for other pursuits, including the study of both English and Italian art history and the translation of Latin classics. He began cooperating with Bruno Bauer on editing Hegel's Philosophy of Religion in 1840. Marx was also engaged in writing his doctoral thesis, The Difference Between the Democritian and Epicurean Philosophy of Nature, which he completed in 1841. It was described as a daring and original piece of work in which Marx set out to show that theology must yield to the superior wisdom of philosophy. The essay was controversial, particularly among the conservative professors at the University of Berlin. Marx decided instead to submit his thesis to the more liberal University of Jena, whose faculty awarded him his PhD in April 1841. As Marx and Bauer were both atheists in March 1841, they began plans for a journal entitled Archive des Atheismus, Atheistic Archives, but it never came to fruition. In July, Marx and Bauer took a trip to Bonn from Berlin. There they scandalised their class by getting drunk, laughing in church and galloping through the streets on donkeys. Marx was considering an academic career, but this path was barred by the government's growing opposition to classical liberalism and the young Hegelians. Marx moved to Cologne in 1848, where he became a journalist writing for the radical newspaper Rheinische Zeitung, Rhineland News, expressing his early views on socialism and his developing interest in economics. Marx criticised right-wing European governments as well as figures in the liberal and socialist movements whom he thought ineffective or counterproductive. The newspaper attracted the attention of the Prussian government censors who checked every issue for seditious material before printing. As Marx lamented, our newspaper has to be presented to the police to be sniffed at, and if the police knows it smells anything unchristian or unprussian, the newspaper is not allowed to appear. After the Ranish Zeitung published an article strongly criticizing the Russian monarchy, Tsar Nicholas I requested it be banned and Prussia's government complied in 1843. Paris, 1843 to 1845. In 1843, Marx became co-editor of a new radical leftist Parisian newspaper, the Deutsche Französische Jarbocker, German-French Annals. Then being set up by the German activist Arnold Rouge to bring together German and French radicals. And thus Marx and his wife moved to Paris in October, 1843. Initially living with Rouge and his wife communally at 23 Rue Vineau, they found the living conditions difficult, so moved out following the birth of their daughter Jenny in 1844. Although intended to attract writers from both France and the German states, the Jabuka was dominated by the latter, and the only non-German writer was the exiled Russian anarchist collectivist Mikhail Bakunin. Marx contributed two essays to the paper, Introduction to a Contribution to the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right and On the Jewish Question the latter introducing his belief that the proletariat were a revolutionary force and marking his embrace of communism. Only one issue was published, but it was relatively successful, largely owing to the inclusion of Heinrich Heine's satirical odes on King Ludwig of Bavaria, leading the German states to ban it and seize imported copies. Rouge nevertheless refused to fund the publication of further issues, and his friendship with Marx broke down. 
After the paper's collapse, Marx began writing for the only uncensored German-language radical newspaper left, Vorwärts Forward. Based in Paris, the paper was connected to the League of the Just, a utopian socialist secret society of workers and artisans. Marx attended some of their meetings but did not join. In Vorwärts, Marx refined his views on socialism based on Hegelian and Faubachian ideas of dialectical materialism at the same time criticizing liberals and other socialists operating in Europe. Picture of Friedrich Engels, whom Marx met in 1844. The two became lifelong friends and collaborators. On 28th of August 1844, Marx met the German socialist Friedrich Engels at the Café de la Regence, beginning a lifelong friendship. Engels showed Marx his recently published The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844, convincing Marx that the working class would be the agent and instrument of the final revolution in history. Soon Marx and Engels were collaborating on a criticism of the philosophical ideas of Marx's former friend Bruno Bauer. This work was published in 1845 as The Holy Family. Although critical of Bauer, Marx was increasingly influenced by the ideas of the young Hegelians Max Stirner and Ludwig Feuerbach, but eventually Marx and Engels abandoned Feuerbachian materialism as well. During the time that he lived at 38 Rue Veneau in Paris from October 1843 until January 1845, Marx engaged in an intensive study of political economy, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, James Mill, etc. The French socialists, especially Claude-Henri Saint-Simon and Charles Fourier, and the history of France. The study of political economy is a study that Marx would pursue for the rest of his life and would result in his major economic work, the three-volume series called Das Kapital. Marxism is based in large part on three influences, Hegel's dialectics, French utopian socialism and English economics. Together with his earlier study of Hegel's dialectics, the studying that Marx did during this time in Paris meant that all major components of Marxism were in place by the autumn of 1844. Marx was constantly being pulled away from his study of political economy, not only by the visual daily demands of the time, but additionally by editing a radical newspaper and later by organising and directing the efforts of a political party during years of potentially revolutionary popular uprisings of the citizenry. Still, Marx was always drawn back to his economic studies. He sought to understand the inner workings of capitalism. An outline of Marxism had definitely formed in the mind of Karl Marx by late 1844. Indeed, many features of the Marxist view of the world's political economy had been worked out in great detail, but Marx needed to write down all of the details of his economic worldview to f further clarify the new economic theory in his own mind. Accordingly, Marx wrote the economic and philosophical manuscripts. These manuscripts covered numerous topics detailing Marx's concept of alienated labour. However, by the spring of 1845, his continued study of political economy, capital and capitalism had led Marx to the belief that the new political eco economic theory that he was espousing, scientific socialism, needed to be built on the base of a thoroughly developed materialistic view of the world. The economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 had been written between April and August 1844, but soon Marx recognised that the manuscripts had been influenced by some inconsistent ideas of Ludwig Feuerbach. Accordingly, Marx recognised the need to break with Feuerbach's philosophy in favour of historical materialism. Thus, a year later, in April 1845, after moving from Paris to Brussels, Marx wrote his 11 Theses on Feuerbach. The Theses on Feuerbach are best known for Thesis 11, which states that Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. This work contains Marx's criticism of materialism for being contemplative, idealism for reducing practice to theory, overall criticising philosophy for putting abstract reality above the physical world. It thus introduced the first glimpse at Marx's historical materialism an argument that with the world is changed not by ideas but by actual physical material activity and practice. In 1845, after receiving a request from the Prussian king 
the French government shut down Vauvort, with the Interior Minister Francois Guizot expelling Marx from France. At this point, Marx moved from Paris to Brussels, where Marx hoped to once again continue his study of capitalism and political economy. Brussels, 1845 to 1848. Picture the first edition of the Manifesto of the Communist Party published in German in 1848. Unable either to stay in France or to move to Germany, Marx decided to emigrate to Brussels in Belgium in February 1845. However, to stay in Belgium, he had to pledge not to publish anything on the subject of contemporary politics. In Brussels, Marx associated with other exiled socialists from across Europe, including Moses Hess, Karl Heinzen and Joseph Wademeyer. In April 1845, Engels moved from Barmen in Germany to Brussels to join Marx and the growing cadre of members of the League of the Just now seeking home in Brussels. Later, Mary Burns, Engels' longtime companion, left Manchester, England to join Engels in Brussels. In mid-July 1845, Marx and Engels left Brussels for England to visit the leaders of the Chartists, a working-class movement in Britain. This was Marx's first trip to England and Engels was an ideal guide for the trip. Engels had already spent two years living in Manchester from November 1842 to August 1844. Not only did Engels already know the English language, he had also developed a close relationship with many Chartist leaders. Indeed, Engels was serving as a reporter for many Chartist and socialist English newspapers. Marx used the trip as an opportunity to examine the economic resources available for study in various libraries in London and Manchester. In collaboration with Engels, Marx also set about writing a book which is often seen as his best treatment of the concept of historical materialism, the German ideology. In this work, Marx broke with Ludwig Feuerbach, Bruno Bauer, Max Stirner and the rest of the young Hegelians, while he also broke with Karl Grun and other true socialists whose philosophies were still based in part on idealism. In German ideology, Marx and Engels finally completed their philosophy, which was based solely on materialism as the sole motor force in history. German ideology is written in a humorously satirical form, but even this satirical form did not save the work from censorship, like so many other early writings of his German ideology would not be published in Marx's lifetime and would be published only in 1932. After completing German ideology, Marx turned to a work that was intended to clarify his own position regarding the theory and tactics of a truly revolutionary proletarian movement, operating from the standpoint of a truly scientific materialist philosophy. This work was intended to draw a distinction between the utopian socialists and Marx's own scientific socialist philosophy. Whereas the utopians believed that people must be persuaded one person at a time to join the socialist movement, the way a person must be persuaded to adopt any different belief. Marx knew that people would tend on most occasions to act in accordance with their own economic interests, thus appealing to an entire class, the working class in this case, with a broad appeal to the class's best material interest would be the best way to mobilise the broad mass of that class to make a revolution and change society. This was the intent of the new book that Marx was planning, but to get the manuscript past the government censors, he called the book The Poverty of Philosophy, 1847, and offered it as a response to the petty bourgeois philosophy of the French anarchist socialist Pierre-Joseph Pradon, as expressed in his book The Philosophy of Poverty, 1840. Picture of Marx with his daughters and Engels. These books laid the foundation for Marx and Engels' most famous work, a political pamphlet that has since come to be commonly known as the Communist Manifesto. While residing in Brussels in 1846, Marx continued his association with the secret radical organisation League of the Just. As noted above, Marx thought the League to be just the sort of radical organisation that was needed to spur the working class of Europe toward the mass movement that would bring about a working-class revolution. However, to organise the working class into a mass movement, the League had to cease its secret or underground orientation and operate in the open as a political party. Members of the League eventually became persuaded in this regard. Accordingly, in June 1847, the League was reorganised 
by its membership into a new open above ground political society that appealed directly to the working classes. This new open political society was called the Communist League. Both Marx and Engels participated in drawing up the program and organisational principles of the new Communist League. In late 1847, Marx and Engels began writing what was to become their most famous work, a program of action for the Communist League. Written jointly by Marx and Engels from December 1847 to January 1848, the Communist Manifesto was first published on 21st of February 1848. The Communist Manifesto laid out the beliefs of the new Communist League. No longer a secret society, the Communist League wanted to make aims and intentions clear to the general public rather than hiding its beliefs, as the League of the Just had been doing. The opening lines of the pamphlet set forth the principal basis of Marxism. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. It goes on to examine the antagonisms that Marx claimed were arising in the clashes of interest between the bourgeoisie, the wealthy capitalist class, and the proletariat, the industrial working class. Proceeding on from this, the manifesto presents the argument for why the Communist League, as opposed to the other socialist and liberal political parties and groups at the time, was truly acting in the interest of the proletariat to overthrow capitalist society and to replace it with socialism. Later that year, Europe experienced a series of protests, rebellions and often violent upheavals that became known as the revolutions of 1848. In France, a revolution led to the overthrow of the monarchy and the establishment of the French Second Republic. Marx was supportive of such activity and having recently received a substantial inheritance from his father, withheld by his uncle Lionel Phillips since his father's death in 1838, of either 6,000 or 5,000 francs, he allegedly used a third of it to arm Belgian workers who were planning revolutionary action, although the veracity of these allegations is disputed. The Belgian Ministry of Justice accused Marx of it, subsequently arresting him and he was forced to flee back to France, where with a new Republican government in power he believed that he would be safe. Cologne, 1848-1849. Temporarily settling down in Paris, Marx transferred the Communist League executive headquarters to the city and also set up a German workers' club with various German socialists living there hoping to see the revolution spread to Germany. In 1848, Marx moved to Cologne, where he began issuing a handbill entitled The Demands of the Communist Party in Germany, in which he argued for only four of the ten points of the Communist Manifesto, believing that in Germany at that time the bourgeoisie must overthrow the feudal monarchy and aristocracy before the proletariat could overthrow the bourgeoisie. On the 1st of June, Marx started publication of a daily newspaper, the New Rheinische Zeitung, which he helped to finance through his recent inheritance from his father. Designed to put forward news from across Europe with his own Marxist interpretation of events, the newspaper featured Marx as a primary writer and the dominant editorial influence. Despite contributions by fellow members of the Communist League, according to Friedrich Engels, it remained a simple dictatorship by Marx. Whilst editor of the paper, Marx and the other revolutionary socialists were regularly harassed by the police and Marx was brought to trial on several occasions, facing various allegations including insulting the chief public prosecutor, committing a press misdemeanour and inciting armed rebellion through tax boycotting, although each time he was acquitted. Meanwhile, the democratic parliament in Prussia collapsed and the king, Frederick William IV, introduced a new cabinet of his reactionary supporters, who implemented counter-revolutionary measures to expunge leftist and other revolutionary elements from the country. Consequently, the new Rheinische Zeitung was soon suppressed and Marx was ordered to leave the country on 16 May. Marx returned to Paris, which was then under the grip of both a reactionary counter-revolution and a cholera epidemic, and was soon expelled by the city authorities who considered him a political threat. With his wife Jenny expecting their fourth child and not able to move back to Germany or Belgium, in August 1849 he sought refuge in London. Moved to London and further writing, 1850-1860. Marx moved to London in early June 1849 and would remain based in the city for the rest of his life. The headquarters of the Communist League also moved to London. However, in the winter of 1849-50, to 50, a split within the ranks of the Communist League occurred when a faction within it led by August Willich and Karl Schapper 
began agitating for an immediate uprising. Willick and Schapper believed that once the Communist League had initiated the uprising, the entire working class from across Europe would rise spontaneously to join it, thus creating revolution across Europe. Marx and Engels protested that such an unplanned uprising on the part of the Communist League was adventuristic and would be suicide for the Communist League. Such an uprising as that recommended by the Schapper Willett group would easily be crushed by the police and the armed forces of the reactionary governments of Europe. Marx maintained that this would spell doom for the Communist League itself, arguing that changes in society are not achieved overnight through the efforts and willpower of a handful of men. They are instead brought about through a scientific analysis of economic conditions of society and by moving toward revolution through different stages of social development. In the present stage of development circa 1850, following the defeat of the uprisings across Europe in 1848, he felt that the Communist League should encourage the working class to unite with progressive elements of the rising bourgeoisie to defeat the feudal aristocracy on issues involving demands for governmental reforms, such as a constitutional republic with freely elected assemblies and universal male suffrage. In other words, the working class must join with the bourgeois and democratic forces to bring about the successful conclusion of the bourgeois revolution before stressing the working class agenda and a working class revolution. After a long struggle which threatened to ruin the Communist League, Marx's opinion prevailed and eventually the willich schapper group left the Communist League. Meanwhile, Marx also became heavily involved with the Socialist German Workers' Educational Society. The society held their meetings in Great Windmill Street, Soho, Central London's Entertainment District. This organisation was also wracked by an internal struggle between its members, some of whom followed Marx while others followed the schapper willich faction. The issues in this internal split were the same issues raised in the internal split with the Communist League, but Marx lost the fight with the schapper willich faction within the German Workers' Educational Society and on 17 September 1850 resigned from the society. New York Daily Tribune and Journalism in the early period in London, Marx committed himself almost exclusively to revolutionary activities such that his family endured extreme poverty. His main source of income was Engels, whose own source was his wealthy industrialist father. In Prussia, as editor of his own newspaper and contributor to others ideologically aligned, Marx could reach his audience, the working classes. In London, without finances to run a newspaper themselves, he and Engels turned to international journalism. At one stage, they were being published by six newspapers from England, the United States, Prussia, Austria, and South Africa. Marx's principal earnings came from his work as a European correspondent from 1852 to 1862 for the New York Daily Tribune, and from also producing articles for more bourgeois newspapers. Marx had his articles translated from German by Wilhelm Pieper, until his proficiency in English had become adequate. The New York Daily Tribune had been founded in 1841 by Horace Greeley. Its editorial board contained progressive bourgeois journalists and publishers, among them George Ripley and the journalist Charles Dana, who was editor-in-chief. Dana, a Fourierist and an abolitionist, was Marx's contact. The Tribune was a vehicle for Marx to reach a transatlantic public to make a hidden war to Henry Charles Carey. The journal had wide working class appeal from its foundation. At two cents, it was inexpensive, and with about 50,000 copies per issue, its circulation was the widest in the United States. Its editorial ethos was progressive, and its anti-slavery stance reflected Greeley's. Mark's first article for the paper on the British parliamentary elections was published on 21st of August, 1852. On 21st of March, 1857, Dana informed Marx that due to the economic recession, only one article a week would be paid for, published or not. The others would be paid for only if published. 
Marx had sent his articles on Tuesdays and Fridays, but that October the Tribune discharged all its correspondence in Europe except Marx and B. Taylor and reduced Marx to a weekly article. Between September and November 1860, only five were published. After a six-month interval, Marx resumed contributions in September 1861 until March 1862, when Dana wrote to inform him that there was no longer space in the Tribune for reports from London due to American domestic affairs. In 1868, Dana set up a rival newspaper, The New York Sun, at which he was editor-in-chief. In April 1857, Dana invited Marx to contribute articles, mainly on military history, to the New American Encyclopedia, an idea of George Ripley's, Dana's friend and literary editor of the Tribune. In all, 67 Marx Engels articles were published, of which 51 were written by Engels, although Marx did some research for them in the British Museum. By the late 1850s, American popular interest in European affairs waned and Marx's articles turned to topics such as the slavery crisis and the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861 in the war between the states. Between December 1851 and March 1852, Marx worked on his theoretical work about the French Revolution of 1848, titled The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. In this, he explored concepts in historical materialism, class struggle, dictatorship of the proletariat, and victory of the proletariat over the bourgeois state. The 1850s and 60s may be said to mark a philosophical boundary distinguishing the young Marx's Hegelian idealism and the more mature Marx's scientific ideology associated with structural Marxism. However, not all scholars accept this distinction. For Marx and Engels, their experience of the revolutions of 1848 to 1849 were formative in the development of their theory of economics and historical progression. After the failures of 1848, the revolutionary impetus appeared spent and not to be renewed without an economic recession. Contention arose between Marx and his fellow communists, whom he denounced as adventurists, Marx deemed it fanciful to propose that willpower could be sufficient to create the revolutionary conditions when in reality the economic component was the necessary requisite. Recession in the United States economy in 1852 gave Marx and Engels grounds for optimism for revolutionary activity, yet this economy was seen as too immature for a capitalist revolution. Open territories on America's western frontier dissipated the forces of social unrest. Moreover, any economic crisis arising in the United States would not lead to revolutionary contagion of the older economies of individual European nations, which were closed systems bounded by their national borders. When the so-called Panic of 1857 in the United States spread globally, it broke all economic theory models and was the first truly global economic crisis. Financial necessity had forced Marx to abandon economic studies in 1844 and give 13 years to working on other projects. He had always sought to return to economics. First International and Das Kapital Picture of the first volume of Das Kapital Marx continued to write articles for the New York Daily Tribune as long as he was sure that the Tribune's editorial policy was still progressive. However, the departure of Charles Dana from the paper in late 1861 and the resultant change in the editorial board brought about a new editorial policy. No longer was the Tribune to be a strong abolitionist paper dedicated to a complete Union victory. The new editorial board supported an immediate peace between the Union and the Confederacy in the Civil War in the United States, with slavery left intact in the Confederacy. Marx strongly disagreed with this new political position and in 1863 was forced to withdraw as a writer for the Tribune. In 1864, Marx became involved in the International Working Men's Association, also known as the First International, to whose general council he was elected at its inception in 1864. In that organisation, Marx was involved in the struggle against the anarchist wing centred on Mikhail Bakunin in 1814-1876. to 1876. Although Marx won this contest, the transfer of the seat of the General Council from London and New York in 
1872, which Marx supported, led to the decline of the international. The most important political event during the existence of the international was the Paris Commune of 1871, when the citizens of Paris rebelled against their government and held the city for two months. In response to the bloody suppression of this rebellion, Marx wrote on one of his most fa famous pamphlets, The Civil War in France, A Defence of the Commune. Given the repeated failures and frustrations of workers' revolutions and movements, Marx also sought to understand capitalism and spent a great deal of time in the reading room of the British Museum studying and reflecting on the works of the political economists and on economic data. By 1857, Marx had accumulated over 800 pages of notes and short essays on capital, landed property, wage labour and the state and foreign trade and the world market. Though this work did not appear in print until 1939 under the title Outlines of the Critique of Political Economy. In 1859, Marx published a contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, his first serious economic work. This work was intended merely as a preview of his three-volume Das Kapital, English title Capital Critique of Political Economy, which he intended to publish at a later date. In a contribution to the critique of political economy, Marx expands on the labour theory of value advocated by David Ricardo. The work was enthusiastically received and the edition sold out quickly. Photo of Marx ph photographed by John Mayall, 1874. The successful sales of a contribution to the critique of political economy stimulated Marx in the early 1860s to finish work on the three large volumes that would comprise his major life's work. Das Kapital and the Theories of Surplus Value, which discuss the theoreticians of political economy, particularly Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Theories of Surplus Value is often referred to as the fourth volume of Das Kapital and constitutes one of the first comprehensive treatises on the history of economic thought. In 1867, the first volume of Das Kapital was published, a work which analysed the capitalist process of production. Here Marx elaborated his labour theory of value, which had been influenced by Thomas Hodgskin. Marx acknowledged Hodgkin's admirable work, Labour defended against the claims of capital at more than one point in Das Kapital. Indeed, Marx quoted Hodgkin as recognising the alienation of labour that occurred under modern capitalist production. No longer was there any natural reward of individual labour. Each labourer produces only some part of a whole, and each part having no value or utility of itself. There is nothing on which the labourer can seize and say, this is my product, this will I keep to myself. In this first volume of Das Kapital, Marx outlined his conception of surplus value and exploitation, which he argued would ultimately lead to a falling rate of profit and the collapse of industrial capitalism. Demand for a Russian language edition of Das Kapital soon led to the printing of 3,000 copies of the book in the Russian language, which was published on 27th of March 1872, by the autumn of 1871, the entire first edition of the German language edition of Das Kapital had been sold out and a second edition was published. Volumes 2 and 3 of Das Kapital remained mere manuscripts upon which Marx continued to work for the rest of his life. Both volumes were published by Engels after Marx's death. Volume 2 of Das Kapital was prepared and published by Engels in July 1893 under the name Kapital II, the process of circulation of capital. Volume 3 of Das Kapital was published a year later in October 1894 under the name Capital 3, the process of capitalist production as a whole. There is a surplus value derived from the sprawling economic manuscripts of 1861 to 1863. A second draft for Das Kapital, the letter spanning volumes 30 to 34 of the collected works of Marx and Engels. Specifically, theories of surplus value runs from the latter part of the collected works 30th volume through the end of the 32nd volume. Meanwhile, the larger economic manuscripts of 1861 to 1863 run from the start of the collected works 30th volume through the first half of their 34th volume. The latter half of the collected works 34th volume consists of the surviving fragments of the economic manuscripts of 1863 to 1864, which represented a third draft of Das Kapital, and a large portion of which is included as an appendix to the Penguin edition of Das Kapital volume 1. A German language abridged edition of Theories of Surplus Value was published in 1905 and in 1910. This abridged edition was translated into English and published in 1951 in London, but the complete unabridged edition of Theories of Surplus Value was published as the fourth volume of Das Kapital in 1963 and 1971 in Moscow. Picture of Marx in 1882. 
During the last decade of his life, Marx's health declined and he became incapable of the sustained effort that had characterised his previous work. He did manage to comment substantially on contemporary politics, particularly in Germany and Russia. His critique of the Gotha program opposed his tendency of his followers Wilhelm Liebnick and August Babel to compromise with the state socialism of Ferdinand Lassalle in the interest of a united socialist party. This work is also notable for another famous Marx quote, from each according to his ability to, to each according to his need. In a letter to Vera Zasulich, dated 8th of March 1881, Marx contemplated the possibility of Russia's bypassing the capitalist stage of development and building communism on the basis of the common ownership of land characteristic of the village mere. While admitting that Russia's rural commune is the fulcrum of social regeneration in Russia, Marx also warned that in order for the mere to operate as a means for moving straight to the socialist stage without a preceding capitalist stage, it would first be necessary to eliminate the deleterious influences which are assailing it, the rural commune, from all sides. Given the elimination of these pernicious influences, Marx allowed that normal conditions of spontaneous development of the rural commune could exist. However, in the same letter to Vera Zasulich, he points out that at the core of the capitalist system lies the complete separation of the producer from the means of production. In one of the drafts of, his, of this letter, Marx reveals his growing passion for anthropology, motivated by his belief that future communism would be a return on a higher level to the communism of our prehistoric past. He wrote that the historical trend of our age is the fatal crisis which capitalist production has undergone in the European and American countries, where it has reached its highest peak, a crisis that will end in its destruction, in the return of modern society to a higher form of the most archaic type, collective production and appropriation. He added that the vitality of primitive communities was incomparably greater than that of Semitic, Greek, Roman, etc. societies, and a fortiori that of modern capitalist societies. Before he died, Marx asked Engels to write up these ideas, which were published in 1884 under the title The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. Personal Life, Family, Picture of Jenny, Carolina and Jenny Laura Marx, 1869. All the Marx daughters were named Jenny in honour of their mother, Jenny von Westphalen. Marx and von Westphalen had seven children together, but partly owing to the poor conditions in which they lived, whilst in London only three survived to adulthood. The children were Jenny Caroline, Jenny Laura, Lafargu, Edgar, Henry Edward Guy, Jenny Eveline Francis, Jenny Julia Eleanor, and one more who died before being named. According to his son-in-law, Paul Lafargu, Marx was a loving father. In 1962, there were allegations that Marx fathered a son, Freddie, out of wedlock by his housekeeper, Helene de Muth but the claim is disputed for lack of documented evidence. Marx frequently used pseudonyms often when renting a house or a flat, apparently to make it harder for the authorities to track him down. While in Paris, he used that of Monsieur Rambos. Whilst in London, he signed off his letters as A. Williams. His friend referred to him as Moore, owing to his dark complexion and black curly hair, while he encouraged his children to call him Old Nick and Charlie. He also bestowed nicknames and pseudonyms on his friends and family as well, Referring to Friedrich Engels as General, his housekeeper Helene as Lenchen or Nim, whilst one of his daughters, Jenny Chen, was referred to as Kui Kui, Emperor of China, and another Laura was known as Kakadu or the Hottentot. Health, although Marx had drunk alcohol before he joined the Trier Tavern Club Drinking Society, after he had joined the club, he began to drink more heavily and continued to do so throughout his whole life. Marx was afflicted by poor health, what he himself described as the wretchedness of existence, and various authors have sought to describe and explain it. His biographer Werner Blumenberg attributed it to liver and gall problems which Marx had in 1849, and from which he was never afterwards free, exacerbated by an unsuitable lifestyle. The attacks often came with headaches, eye inflammation, neuralgia in the head, and rheumatic pains. A serious nervous disorder appeared in 1877 and protracted insomnia was a consequence, which Marx fought with narcotics. The illness was aggravated by excessive nocturnal work and faulty diet. Marx was fond of highly seasoned dishes, smoked fish, caviar, pickled cucumbers, none of which are good for liver patients, but he also liked wine and liqueurs and smoked an enormous amount, and since he had no money it was usually bad quality cigars. From 1863, Marx complained a lot 
about boils, these are very frequent with liver patients and may be due to the same causes. The abscesses were so bad that Marx could neither sit nor work upright. According to Blumenberg, Marx's irritability is often found in liver patients. The illness emphasised certain traits in his character. He argued cuttingly his biting satire did not shrink at insults and his expressions could be rude and cruel. Though in general Marx had a blind faith in his closest friends, nevertheless he himself complained that he was sometimes too mistrustful and unjust even to them. His verdicts, not only about enemies but even about friends, were sometimes so harsh that even less sensitive people would take offence. There must have been few whom he did not criticise like this. Not even Engels was an exception. According to Princeton historian J.E. Siegel, in his late teens, Marx may have had pneumonia or pleurisy, the effects of which led to his being exempted from Prussian military service. In later life, while working on Das Kapital, which he never completed, Marx suffered from a trio of afflictions. A liver ailment, probably hereditary, was aggravated by overwork, bad diet and a lack of sleep. Inflammation of the eyes was induced by too much work at night. A third affliction, eruption of carbuncles or boils, was probably brought on by general physical debility to which the various features of Marx's style of life, alcohol, tobacco, poor diet and failure to sleep all contributed. Engels often exhorted Marx to alter this dangerous regime. In Professor Siegel's thesis, what lay behind this punishing sacrifice of his health may have been guilt about self-involvement and egoism, originally induced in Karl Marx by his father. In 2007, a retrodiagnosis of Marx's skin disease was made by dermatologist Sam Schuster of Newcastle University, and for Schuster, the most probable explanation was that Marx suffered not from liver problems, but from hydradenitis suppurativa, a recurring infective condition arising from blockage of apocrine ducts opening into hair follicles. This condition, which was not described in the English medical literature until 1933, hence would not have been known to Marx's physicians, can produce joint pain which could be misdiagnosed as rheumatic disorder and painful eye conditions. To arrive at his retrodiagnosis, Schuster considered the primary material, the Marx correspondence published in the 50 volumes of the Marx-Engels collected works. There, although the skin lesions were called for uncles, boils and carbuncles by Marx, his wife and his physicians, they were too persistent, recurrent, destructive and site-specific for that diagnosis. The sites of persistent carbuncles were noted repeatedly in the armpits, groins, perianal, genital and suprapubic regions and inner thighs. Favoured sites of hydradenitis suppurativa, Professor Schuster claimed the diagnosis can now be made definitively. Schuster went on to consider the potential psychosocial effects of the disease, noting that the skin is an organ of communication and that hydradenitis suppurativa produces much psychological distress, including loathing and disgust and depression of self-image, mood and well-being, feelings for which Schuster found much evidence in the Marx correspondence. Professor Schuster went on to ask himself whether the mental effects of the disease affected Marx's work and even helped him to develop, to develop his theory of alienation. Death Tomb of Karl Marx, East Highgate Cemetery in London. Following the death of his wife Jenny in December 1881, Marx developed a guitar that kept him in ill health for the last 15 months of his life. It eventually brought on the bronchitis and pleurisy that killed him in London on 14th of March 1883, when he died a stateless person at age 64. Family and friends in London buried his body in Highgate Cemetery, East London, on 17th of March 1883, in an area reserved for agnostics and atheists. George Eliot's grave is nearby. There were between nine and eleven mourners at his funeral. Research from contemporary sources identifies 13 named individuals attending the funeral. They were Friedrich Engels, Eleanor Marx, Edward Averling, Paul Lefagu, Charles Longway, Helen de Muth, Wilhelm Liebknecht, Gottlieb Lemke, Frederick Lesner, G. Lochner, Sir Ray Lancaster, Carl Schorlemmer, and Ernest Radford. A contemporary newspaper account claims that 25 to 30 relatives and friends attended the funeral. A writer in the graphic noted that by a strange blunder, his death was not announced for two days and then as having taken place at Paris. Next day, the correction came from Paris, and when his friends and followers hastened to his house in Haverstock Hill to learn the time and place of burial, they learned that he was already in the cold ground, but for this secrecy and haste a great popular demonstration would undoubtedly have been held over his grave several of his closest friends spoke at his funeral including wilhelm liebnicht and friedrich engels engels speech included the passage 
On the 14th of March, at a quarter to three in the afternoon, the greatest living thinker ceased to think. He had been left alone for scarcely two minutes, and when we came back, we found him in his armchair, peacefully gone to sleep, but forever. Marx's surviving daughters, Eleanor and Laura, as well as Charles Longway and Paul, Paul Lafargue, Marx's two French socialist sons-in-law, were also in attendance. He had been predeceased by his wife and his eldest daughter, the latter dying a few months earlier in January 1883. Liebnick, a founder and leader of the German Social Democratic Party, gave a speech in German and Longway, a prominent figure in the French working class movement, made a short statement in French. Two telegrams from workers' parties in France and Spain were also read out, together with Engels' speech. This constituted the entire program of the funeral. Non-relatives attending the funeral included three communist associates of Marx, Friedrich Lesner, imprisoned for three years after the Cologne Communist Trial of 1852, G. Lochner, whom Engels described as an old member of the Communist League, and Karl Schorlemmer, a professor of chemistry in Manchester, a member of the Royal Society and a communist activist involved in the 1848 Baden Revolution. Another attendee of the funeral was Sir Ray Lancaster, a British zoologist who would later become a prominent academic. Marx left a personal estate valued for probate at £250, equivalent to £25,000 in 2019. Upon his own death in 1895, Engels left Marx's two surviving daughters a significant portion of his considerable estate valued in 2011 at US $4.8 million. Marx and his family were reburied on a new site nearby in November 1954. The tomb at the new site, unveiled on 14 March 1956, bears the card message, Workers of all lands unite. The final line of the Communist Manifesto and from the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, as edited by Engels, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. The Communist Party of Great Britain had the monument with a portrait bust by Lawrence Bradshaw erected and Marx's original tomb had only humble adornment. The Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm remarked, one cannot say Marx died a failure because although he had not achieved a large following of disciples in Britain, his writings had already begun to make an impact on the leftist movements in Germany and Russia. Within 25 years of his death, the continental European socialist parties that acknowledged Marx's influence on their politics were each gaining between 15 and 47 percent in those countries with representative democratic elections. Thought. Influences. Main article influences on Karl Marx. Marx's thought demonstrates influences from many thinkers, including but not limited to Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's philosophy, the classical political economy economics of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, as well as Jean Charles Leonard de Sismondi's critique of laissez faire economics and analysis of the precarious state of the proletariat. French socialist thought, in particular the thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Henri de Saint-Simon, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, and Charles Fourier. Early German philosophical materialism among the young Hegelians, particularly that of Ludwig Feuerbach and Bruno Bauer, as well as the French materialism of the late 18th century, including Diderot, Claude, Adrien, Helvetius, and de Holbach. The work in class analysis by Friedrich Engels, as well as the early descriptions of class provided by French liberals and saint simonians such as François Guizot and Augustin Thierry. Marx's Judaic legacy has been identified as formative to both his moral outlook and his materialist philosophy. Marx's view of history, which came to be called historical materialism, controversially adapted as the philosophy of dialectical materialism by Engels and Lenin, certainly shows the influence of Hegel's claim that one should view reality and history dialectically. However, Hegel had thought in idealist terms, putting ideas in the forefront, whereas Marx sought to rewrite dialectics in materialist terms, arguing for the primacy of matter over idea. Where Hegel saw the spirit as driving history, Marx saw this as an unnecessary mystification, obscuring the reality of humanity and its physical actions shaping the world. He wrote that Hegelianism stood the movement of reality on its head, and that one needed to set it upon its feet. Despite his dislike of mystical terms, Marx used Gothic language in several of his works. In the Communist Manifesto, he proclaims a spectre is haunting Europe, a spectre of communism. All the powers of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exercise this spectre. And in the capital, he refers to capital as necromancy that surrounds the products of labour. 
Though inspired by French socialists and sociological thought, Marx criticised utopian socialists, arguing that their favoured small-scale socialistic communities would be bound to marginalisation and poverty, and that only a large-scale change in the economic system can bring about real change. The other important contributions to Marx's revision of Hegelianism came from Engels' book The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844, which led Marx to conceive of the historical dialectic in terms of class conflict and to see the modern working class as the most progressive force for revolution, as well as from the social democrat Friedrich Wilhelm Schultz, who in Die Bewegung der Produktion described the movement of society as flowing from the contradiction between the forces of production and the mode of production. Marx believed that he could study history and society scientifically and discern tendencies of history and the resulting outcome of social conflicts. Some followers of Marx therefore concluded that a communist revolution would inevitably occur. However, Marx famously asserted in the 11th of his theses on Feuerbach that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And he clearly dedicated himself to trying to alter the world. Philosophy and Social Thought Marx's polemic with other thinkers often occurred through critique, and thus he has been called the first great user of critical method in social sciences. He criticised speculative philosophy, equating metaphysics with ideology. By adopting this approach, Marx attempted to separate key findings from ideological biases. This set him apart from many contemporary philosophers. Human nature. Further information, Marx's theory of human nature. The philosophers G. W. F. Hegel and Ludwig Feuerbach, whose ideas on dialectics heavily influenced Marx. Like Tocqueville, who described a faceless and bureaucratic despotism with no identifiable despot, Marx also broke with classical thinkers who spoke of a single tyrant and with Montesquieu, who discussed the nature of the single despot. Instead, Marx set out to analyse the despotism of capital. Fundamentally, Marx assumed that human history involves transforming human nature, which encompasses both human beings and material objects. Humans recognise that they possess both actual and potential selves. For both Marx and Hegel, self-development begins with an experience of internal alienation stemming from this recognition, followed by realisation that the actual self, as a subjective agent, renders its potential counterpart an object to be apprehended. Marx further argues that by moulding nature in desired ways, the subject takes the object as its own and thus permits the individual to be actualised as fully human. For Marx, the human nature, Gattung, Swearson, or species being, exists as a function of human labour. Fundamental to Marx's idea of meaningful labour is the proposition that for a subject to come to terms with its alienated object, it must first exert influence upon literal material objects in the subject's world. Marx acknowledges that Hegel grasps the nature of work and comprehends objective man authentic because actual as the result of his own work, but characterizes Hegelian self-development as unduly spiritual and abstract. Marx thus departs from Hegel by insisting that the fact that man is a corporeal, actual, sentient, objective being with natural capacities means that he has actual, sensuous objects for his nature as objects of his life expression, or that he can only express his life in actual, sensuous objects. Consequently, Marx revises Hegelian work into material labour, and in the context of human capacity to transform nature, the term labour power. Labour class struggle and false consciousness. Further information, labour theory of value. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, Karl Marx, Communist Manifesto. Picture of a monument dedicated to Marx and Engels in Shanghai, China. Marx had a special concern with how people relate to their own labour power. He wrote extensively about this in terms of the problem of alienation. As with the dialectic, Marx began with the Hegelian notion of alienation, but developed a more materialistic conception. Capitalism mediates social relationships of production, such as among workers or between workers and capitalists, through commodities, including labour, that are bought and sold on the market. For Marx, the possibility that one may give up ownership of one's labour, one's capacity to transform the world, is tantamount to being alienated from one's own nature, and it's a spiritual loss. Marx described this loss as a commodity fetishism, in which the things that people produce commodities appear to have a life and movement of their own to which humans and their behaviour merely adapt. Commodity fetishism provides an example of what Engels called false consciousness, which relates closely to the understanding of ideology. By ideology, Marx and Engels meant ideas that reflect the 
interests in, of a particular class at a particular time in history, but which contemporaries see as universal and eternal. Marx and Engels' point was not only such that such beliefs are at best half-truths as they serve an important political function. Put another way, the control that one class exercises over the means of production includes not only the production of food or manufactured goods, but also the production of ideas. This provides one possible explanation for why members of subordinate class may hold ideas contrary to their own interests. An example of this sort of analysis is Marx's understanding of religion summed up in a passage from the preface to his 1843 contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. Whereas his gymnasium senior thesis at the Gymnasium Zutria argued that religion had as its primary social aim the promotion of solidarity, here Marx sees the social function of religion in terms of highlighting, preserving political and economic status quo and inequality. Marx was an outspoken opponent of child labour, saying that British industries could but live by sucking blood and children's blood too, and that US capital was financed by the capitalised blood of children. Economy, History and Society, Further Information, Marxian Economics Mirror by Diego Rivera, showing Karl Marx in the National Palace in Mexico City Marx's thoughts on labour were related to the primacy he gave to the economic relation in determining the society's past, present and future, see also economic determinism Accumulation of capital shares a social system for Marx, social change was about conflict between opposing interests, driven in the background by economic forces. This became the inspiration for the body of works known as the conflict theory. In his evolutionary model of history, he argued that human history began with free, productive and creative work that was over time coerced and dehumanised, a trend most apparent under capitalism. Marx noted that this was not an intentional process, rather no individual or even state can go against the forces of economy. The organisation of society depends on means of production. The means of production are all things required to produce material goods such as land, natural resources and technology but not human labour. The relations of production are the social relationships which people enter into as they acquire and use the means of production. Together these compose the mode of production and Marx distinguished historical eras in terms of modes of production. Marx differentiated between base and superstructure, where the base or substructure is the economic system and superstructure is the cultural and political system. Marx regarded this mismatch between economic base and social superstructure as a major source of social disruption and conflict. Despite Marx's stress on critique of capitalism and discussion of the new communist society that should replace it, his explicit critique is guarded as he saw it as an improved society compared to the past ones, slavery and feudalism. Marx never clearly discusses issues of morality and justice, but scholars agree that his work contained implicit discussion of those concepts. Picture memorial to Karl Marx in Moscow, whose inscription reads, Proletarians of all countries unite. Marx's view of capitalism was two-sided. On one hand, in the 19th century, deepest critiques of the dehumanising aspects of this system. He noted that defining features of capitalism include alienation, exploitation and recurring cyclical depressions leading to mass unemployment. On the other hand, he characterised capitalism as revolutionising, industrialising and universalising qualities of development, growth and progressivity, by which Marx meant industrialisation, urbanisation, technological progress, increased productivity and growth, rationality and scientific revolution that are responsible for progress. Marx considered the capitalist class to be one of the most revolutionary in history because it constantly improved the means of production, more so than any other class in history, and was responsible for the overthrow of feudalism. Capitalism can stimulate considerable growth because the capitalist has an incentive to reinvest profits in new technologies and capital equipment. According to Marx, capitalists take advantage of the difference between the labour market and the market for whatever commodity the capitalist can produce. The Marx observed that in practically every successful industry, input unit costs are lower than output unit prices. Marx called the difference surplus value and argued that it was based on surplus labour. The difference between what it costs to keep workers alive and what they can produce. 
Although Marx describes capitalists as vampires sucking workers' blood, he notes that drawing profit is by no means an injustice, and the capitalists cannot go against the system. The problem is the cancerous cell of capital, understood not as property or equipment, but the relations between workers and owners, the economic system in general. At the same time, Marx stressed that capitalism was unstable and prone to periodic crises. He suggested that over time capitalists would invest more and more in new technologies and less and less in labour. Since Marx believed that profit derived from surplus value appropriated from labour, he concluded that the rate of profit would fall as the economy grows. Marx believed that increasingly severe crises would punctuate this cycle of growth and collapse. Moreover, he believed that in the long term, this process would enrich and empower the capitalist class and impoverish the proletariat. In section one of the Communist Manifesto, Marx describes feudalism, capitalism and the role internal social contradictions play in the historical process. We see then the means of production and of exchange on whose foundation the bourgeoisie built itself up were generated in feudal society. At a certain stage in the development of these means of production and of exchange, the conditions under which feudal society produced and exchanged, the feudal relations of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces. They became so many fetters. They had to be burst asunder. They were burst asunder. Into their place stepped free competition, accompanied by a social and political constitution adapted in it, and the economic and political sway of the bourgeois class. A similar movement is going on before our eyes. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer lend to further development of the conditions of bourgeois property. On the contrary, they have become too powerful for these conditions by which they are fettered. And so soon as they overcome these fetters, they bring order into the whole of bourgeois society, endanger the existence of bourgeois property. Picture outside a factory in Oldham, Marx believed that industrial workers, the proletariat, would rise up around the world. Marx believed that those structural contradictions within capitalism necessitate its end giving way to socialism or a post-capitalistic communist society. The development of modern industry therefore cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces the and appropriates products. What the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Thanks to various processes overseen by capitalism, such as urbanisation, the working class and proletariat should grow in numbers and develop class consciousness. In time, realising that they can and must change the system. Marx believed that if the proletariat were to seize the means of production, they would encourage social relations that would benefit everyone equally, abolishing exploiting class and introduce a system of production less vulnerable to cyclical crises. Marx argued in the German ideology that capitalism will end through the organised actions of an international working class. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. In this new society, the alienation would end and humans would be free to act without being bound by the labour market. It would be a democratic society enfranchising the entire population. In such a utopian world, there would also be little need for a state, whose goal was previously to enforce the alienation. Marx theorised that between capitalism and the establishment of a socialist communist system would exist a period of dictatorship of the proletariat, where the working class holds particular political power and forcibly socialises the means of production, as he wrote in his critique on the Gotha programme. Between capitalist and communist society, there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one into the other. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. While he allowed for the possibility of peaceful transition in some countries with strong democratic institutional structures such as Britain, the United States and the Netherlands, he suggested that in other countries in which workers cannot attain their goal by peaceful means, the lever of our revolution must be forced. International Relations, Karl Marx Monument in Chemnitz, known as Karl Marx Start from 1953 to 1990. Marx viewed Russia as the main counter-revolutionary threat to European revolutions. During the Crimean War, Marx backed the Ottoman Empire and its allies Britain and France against Russia. He was absolutely opposed to pan-Slavism, viewing it as an instrument of Russian foreign policy. Marx had considered the Slavic nations except Poles as counter-revolutionary. Marx and Engels published in the New Rheinische 
Zeitung in February 1849, to the sentimental phrases about brotherhood which we are being offered here on behalf of the most counter-revolutionary nations of Europe, we reply that hatred of Russians was and still is the primary revolutionary passion among Germans, that since the revolution of 1848, hatred of Czechs and Croats has been added, and that only by the most determined use of terror against these Slav peoples can we jointly with the Poles and Magyars safeguard the revolution. We know where the enemies of the revolution are concentrated, viz. in Russia and the Slav regions of Austria. And no fine phrases, no allusions to an undefined democratic future for these countries can deter us from treating our enemies as enemies. Then there will be a struggle, an inexorable life and death struggle against those Slavs who betray the revolution and an annihilating fight and ruthless terror, not in the interests of Germany, but in the interests of the revolution. Marx and Engels sympathised with the Narodnik revolutionaries in the 1860s and 70s when the Ruff Russian revolutionaries assassinated Tsar Alexander II of Russia. Marx expressed the hope that the assassination foreshadowed the formation of a Russian commune. Marx supported the Polish uprisings against Tsarist Russia. He said in a speech in London in 1867, In the first place, the policy of Russia is changeless. Its methods, its tactics, its manoeuvres may change, but the polar star of its policy, world domination, is a fixed star. In our times, only a civilised government ruling over barbarian masses can hatch out such a plan and execute it. There is but one alternative for Europe. Either Asiatic barbarism under Muscovite direction will burst around its head like an avalanche, or else it must re-establish Poland, thus putting 20 million heroes between itself and Asia and gaining a breathing spell for the accomplishment of its social regeneration. Poster CPI Mural in Kerala, India Marx supported the cause of Irish independence. In 1867, he wrote Engels, I used to think the separation of Ireland from England impossible. I now think it inevitable. The English working class will never accomplish anything until it has got rid of Ireland. English reaction in England had its roots in the subjugation of Ireland. Marx spent some time in French Algeria, which had been invaded and made a French colony in 1830 and had opportunity to observe life in colonial North Africa. He wrote about the colonial justice system in which a form of torture has been used, and this happens regularly, to extract confessions from the Arabs. Naturally, it is done, like the English in India, by the police. The judge is supposed to know nothing about it at all. Marx was surprised by the arrogance of many European settlers in Algier, and wrote in a letter, when a European colonist dwells among the lesser breeds, either as a settler or even on business, he generally regards himself as even more inviolable than handsome William a Prussian king. Still, when it comes to barefaced arrogance and presumptuousness vis-à-vis -vis the lesser breeds, the British and Dutch outdo the French. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Marx's analysis of colonialism as a progressive force bringing modernization to a backward feudal society sounds like a transparent rationalization for foreign domination. His account of British domination, however, reflects the same ambivalence that he shows towards capitalism in Europe. In both cases, Marx recognises the immense suffering brought about during the transition from feudal to bourgeois society. While insisting that the transition is both necessary and ultimately progressive, he argues that the penetration of foreign commerce will cause a social revolution in India. Marx discussed British colonial rule in India in the New York Herald Tribune in June 1853. There cannot remain any doubt but that the misery inflicted by the British on Hindustan, India, is of an essentially different and infinitely more intensive kind than all Hindustan had to suffer before. England has broken down the entire framework of Indian society without any symptoms of reconstitution yet appearing. However, we must not forget that these idyllic village communities, inoffensive though they may appear, had always been the solid foundation of oriental despotism, that they restrained the human mind within the smallest possible compass, making it the unresisting tool of superstition. Legacy. Main article, Marxism. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, monument in Marx-Engels Forum, Berlin, Mitte, Germany. Karl Marx statue in Trier, Germany. Marx's ideas have had a profound impact on the world, politics and intellectual thought. Followers of Marx has often debated among themselves over how to interpret Marx's writings and apply his concepts to the modern world. The legacy of Marx's thought has become contested between numerous tendencies, each of which sees itself as Marx's most accurate interpreter. 
In the political realm, these tendencies include Leninism, Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism, Maoism, Luxembourgism, and Libertarian Marxism. Various currents have also developed in academic Marxism, often under influence of other views resulting in structural Marxism, historical Marxism, phenomenological Marxism, analytical Marxism, and Hegelian Marxism. From an academic perspective, Marx's work contributed to the birth of modern sociology. He has been cited as one of the 19th century's three masters of the school of suspicion alongside Friedrich Nietzsche and Sigmund Freud, and as one of the three principal architects of modern social science along with Emile Durkheim and Max Weber. In contrast to other philosophers, Marx offered theories that could often be tested with a scientific method. Both Marx and Auguste Comte set out to develop scientifically justified ideologies in the wake of European secularization and new developments in the philosophies of history and science. Working in the Hegelian tradition, Marx rejected Comtean sociological positivism in an attempt to develop a science of society. Karl Loweth considered Marx and Soren Kierkegaard to be the two greatest Hegelian philosophical successors. In modern sociological theory, Marxist sociology is regarded as one of the main classical perspectives. Isaiah Berlin considers Marx the true founder of modern sociology, insofar as anyone can claim the title. Beyond social science, he has also had a lasting legacy in philosophy, literature, the arts and the humanities. Map of countries that declared themselves to be socialist states under the Marxist, Leninist or Maoist definition between 1979 and 1983 which marked the greatest territorial extent of socialist states. Social theorists of the 20th and 21st centuries have pursued two main strategies in response to Marx. One move has been to reduce it to its analytical core, known as analytical Marxism. Another more common move has been to dilute the explanatory claims of Marx's social theory and emphasise the relative autonomy of aspects of social and economic life not directly related to Marx's central narrative of interaction between the development of the forces of production and the succession of modes of production. This has been the neo-Marxist theorising adopted by historians inspired by Marx's social theories such as E.P. Thompson and Eric Hobsbawm. It has also been a line of thinking pursued by thinkers and activists such as Antonio Gramsci who have sought to understand the opportunities and the difficulties of transformative political practice seen in the light of Marx's social theory. Marx's ideas would also have a profound influence on subsequent artists and art history with avant-garde movements across literature, visual art, music and film and theatre. Politically, Marx's legacy is more complex. Throughout the 20th century, revolutions in dozens of countries labelled labeled themselves Marxist, most notably the Russian Revolution, which led to the founding of the Soviet Union. Major world leaders, including Vladimir Lenin, Mao Zedong, Fidel Castro, Salvador Allende, Josip Broz Tito, Kwame Nkrumah, Jawaharlal Nehru, Nelson Mandela, Xi Jinping, Jean-Claude Juncker and Thomas Sankara, have all cited Marx as an influence beyond where Marxist revolutions took place. Marx's ideas have informed political parties worldwide. In countries associated with some Marxist claims, some events have led political opponents to blame Marx for millions of deaths. But the fidelity of these varied revolutionary leaders and parties to Marx's work is highly contested and has been rejected, including by many Marxists. It is now common to distinguish between the legacy and influence of Marx specifically and the legacy and influence of those who have shaped his ideas for political purposes. Andrew Lipau describes Marx and his collaborator Friedrich Engels as the founders of the modern revolutionary democratic socialism. Marx remains both relevant and controversial. In May 2018, to mark the bicentenary of his birth, a 4.5 metre statue of him by leading Chinese sculptor Wu Weishan and donated by the Chinese government was unveiled in his birthplace of Trier. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker defended Marx's memory, saying that today Marx stands for things which he is not responsible for and which he didn't cause because many of the things he wrote down were redrafted into the opposite. In 2017, a feature film titled The Young Karl Marx featured Marx, his wife, Jenny Marx and Engels, among other revolutionaries and intellectuals prior to the revolutions of 1848 received good reviews for both its historical accuracy and its brio in dealing with intellectual life. Selected Bibliography The Difference Between the Democritian and Epicurean Philosophy of Nature, Doctoral Thesis, 1841 
Philosophical Manifesto of the Historical School of Law, 1842. Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, 1843. On the Jewish Question, 1843. Notes on James Mill, 1844. Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. The Holy Family, 1845. Theses on Feuerbach, 1845. The German Ideology, 1845. Poverty of Philosophy, 1847. Wage, Labour and Capital, 1847. Manifesto of the Communist Party, 1848. Class Struggles in France, 1850. 18th Premier of Louis Napoleon, 1852. Grand Rice, 1857. Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, 1859. Writings on the US Civil War, 1861. Theories of Surplus Value, three volumes, 1862. Value, Price and Profit, 1865. Das Kapital, volume 1, 1867. The Civil War in France, 1871. The Critique of Goethe Program, 1875. Notes on Adolf Wagner, 1883. Das Kapital, 2, posthumously published by Engels, 1885. Das Kapital, 3, posthumously published by Engels, 1894. And then a list of see also including criticism criticisms of Marxism, Marxian class theory, Marxian economics, Marx's method, political economy, pre-Marx socialists, timeline of Karl Marx, Adam Smith. So that was Karl Marx. And there's a few places we can go from here. But that brings us to the next step in postmodern mythology. Thanks for listening.